In this video, I want to continue the discussion that we're having about the hidden Markov model. In the last video, what we looked at was a motivation for the forward-backward algorithm. And in this video, what I want to do is describe the forward-backward algorithm in detail. As you recall, we were motivated in this example by a robot that moves around the room where the different locations in the room were the different states. Because it's in an apartment, the robot doesn't have access to GPS and needs to keep track of where it is. To do that, it's going to take camera pictures of the floor and treat those as observations, trying to understand where it is in the world based on knowing how the um, apartment is laid out and where the um, floor coverings are. This is all work that, is, um, that, was, um, that I learned from a paper by Rabiner et al. By, by Rabiner, and uh, more information is available there. That's my source. Okay, so where we left off was recognizing that calculating the probability of a set of observations given the parameters of our model, lambda, was infeasible to do it directly. We imagined that we would enumerate all possible transitions through the state space given a length of observations, capital T, and for each one of those enumerated sequence of state spaces, we would sum the probability of that particular state sequence giving us the observations that we've seen. We were able to calculate that using parameters of our model, pi q1 being the probability of starting in state q1, bq101 being the probability of observing symbol 01 when we're in state q1, AQ1Q2 being the probability of moving from state Q1 to state Q2, and then BQ2OQ2 being the probability of seeing the second observation in the second state that we're in. That continues doing an alternating product of the probability of moving from one state to the next state, the probability of seeing the observation in that state, the probability of moving from the, that state to the next state until we get the, to the end of our observation sequence where finally we say the probability of moving from state qt minus 1 to state q2 times the probability of observing symbol ot in state qt is how we end our product. That was infeasible because of the number of state sequences that we could possibly have and the size of this computation. Um, together, those two things were way too many. And that motivated the um, introduction of an idea called the forward-backward algorithm. Now the forward-backward algorithm relies on two particular helper functions, alpha and beta, but we'll start off by just talking about the alpha helper function. Now the alpha helper function, the role, what it's gonna do is it's gonna help us to reduce the number of calculations that we need to make in order to calculate the probability that is our goal. And it turns out that when we do some of these calculations, because our, ends, our end goal is to do, find the probability of O given lambda, there are a lot of repeated calculations that are made. And by introducing alpha, we can reduce the number of repeated calculations. So let's define this quantity. Alpha sub t, now be, be careful, recognize that alpha is different than a. a is our probability of transitioning from one state to another. Alpha is an aggregate helper variable. So I'll try and speak clearly and get that correct so I don't confuse you anymore. Alpha sub t um, at i is the probability of seeing observation one, two, three, all the way up to lowercase t, so t different observations, and then ending up in state si at time qt, given our model. All right, so you can see that this is different than what we had before, because our, our kind of our overall goal is trying to figure out the probability of O given our model. But what this, what this helper function is, is doing is two things. One, it's limiting the time in which it's considering the probability. So it's only going up to lowercase t, not to capital T. So it's going through the sequence of states. And it's also committing to ending at one particular state. So it's not considering all possible state sequences. It's, it's considering all possible state sequences up to time lowercase t, and then transitioning to state qt. And we say that the state that we're going to represent is i. All right, so this is our helper function. This is generally what it's, ca this is generally what it's ca capturing. Now let's talk about how that we can actually calculate it efficiently. We're gonna do this inductively. And so for an inductive cal calculation, we need to have a starting case. So let's introduce that. Our base case for alpha, alpha, that should be alpha one. It says alpha i on my slide. I'll have to correct that. Should be alpha sub one 
and then in parentheses, it's i. Because it's the base case, it's alpha 1. And the base case is going to be calculated from pi i, what is the probability of starting in state i, times b uh, b i o 1, meaning what is the probability of seeing observation number 1 given that we're in state i. All right. So this is a base case, it's a straightforward computation, and it only considers up until time one. Now let's consider the inductive case, the inductive step. In the inductive step, we're going to increase alpha by one time step, so we're going to define it in terms of alpha t plus one of a different state j, and we're going to say that that quantity is going to be built on the previous quantities. All right, so we've already defined alpha t sub i, that's within our brackets from our base case or from our inductive step previously. And so we're gonna say that the probability of alpha t plus one j is going to be equal to the sum of all the different ways of getting to state j given our observation sequence up until the previous time step. So we're gonna go through all the states in our summation, one through n. We're gonna consider the probability that we were in that state given the, the observations up until time t, and then we're gonna consider moving forward into state j. So we're gonna sum over a bunch of different possible ways of getting to j times a transition to j. And then finally, once we calculate that sum, we're going to multiply it times the probability of seeing our next observation given that we're now in state j, okay? Then, for our final step, we need to take the alpha variables at the final time step, capital T, and we need to sum over all the states that we could have ended up in the probability of ending up in that state given our observation sequence. So if we look at the top, the top uh, formula, we see alpha t sub i is the probability of O1 to O lowercase t and then ending up in state si. So when we have calculated all of our alpha t's using this inductive method, that's fine. We can tell what the probability is of ending up at state one, two, three, or four given our sequence of observations by looking at the alpha quantity. But in order to finally get the overall probability, we have to sum over all the possible states that we could have ended up in. And that's the bottom equation, summing from one to n over alpha t sub i. It's a really elegant equation. Sometimes it's hard to understand what it's doing. So let me try and present visually what's happening here. What we're doing is we're considering all the possible states that we could be in at time t. And we said that we know that there was some sequence of observations that led up to that time step. And by using the alpha t variable, we can say, well, I know what the probability is of being in state S1 or S2 or S3, given all the observations that came before it, regardless of how I got there. Alpha captures the probability given all the possible ways of getting there. But given that we're now in state one with the sequence of observations, we have to figure out what the probability is of being in state Sj given the whole previous sequence of observations. And so to do that, we sum over all the states we previously could have been in, move it forward, modified by the likelihood of seeing that transition, A, the transition probabilities are A, A1 uh, A to J, A2 to J, A3 to J, all the way down to An to J. So we're moving that probability mass from our previous state at time t to our state at t plus 1 and summing over all the possible ways we could have gotten to sj and then weighting it by the observation at time j. If we do this building out at time 1 and then time 2 and then time 3 and then all the way up to time capital T, we form a lattice of calculations where here graphically we represent each one of the states, each one of the positions that we can be in vertically and each one of the observations uh, along the bottom, one through t, and we calculate the first column using that base case, and then we extend it to the second column using our inductive step until we get to the very final step, doing inductive steps all the way, and all those alpha parameters at time t say what is the probability of being in state one, two, three, all the way up to state n, 
given the sequence of observations that have come before. Very elegant. Now remember, the motivation for this was to calculate the probability of our observation given lambda. And so we have to sum over that final column in order to figure out what that is. And if you remember, to do this um, directly took an enormous amount of calculations. We figured it was something like on the order of 10 to the 72 calculations if we literally enumerated all possible states. But by doing this inductive method of building up the probabilities in our sequence one by one, we're able to do much better. So if we look at our lattice that we calculate, you can see that the number of calculations that we perform is order n squared times t. Where is the n squared coming from? Well, at each inductive step, we have to do a calculation from all previous states to all next states. So that's n times n, n squared. And then we have to do an n squared computation for every one of our t observations. So it, it's order n squared over t. We actually have to do it for t minus 1 observations because we're only doing it between states. But order n squared t. Well, if we compare that to 10 to the 72 calculations for the same situation, if we had five states and 100 time steps, we only have on the order of 3,000 calculations in order to calculate this efficiently. That is so much better than 10 to the 72 calculations. And it is exactly why the forward backward algorithm is so um, appealing. It makes it possible to do this kind of reasoning with the HMM in a way that just wouldn't be possible without it. So that forward part, that alpha variable, is all we need in order to solve that first problem. The first problem being the probability of observations given our model lambda. But because we're going to need the backward parameter as well, in the other two problems, let me motivate the introduction of the backward parameter, or beta, as well. We just do the same thing, but we think about it, instead of moving forward step by step, we're going to move backward step by step. Kind of answering the question, what is the probability that we started in state t, and given the observations from time t forward, we were, what's the probability of being in state t given what we're going to see in the future? So it's not something that you could do in real time. It's something that you can only do once you know what the future looks like. So we're going to define that as beta t sub i, exactly, uh, exactly analogous to alpha t sub i. But instead, we're going to look forward in time. We're going to say beta t i is the probability of seeing observation t plus 1, t plus 2, all the way up to observation t, given that at time q t, we're in state s i. So what's the probability that we are going to see the sequence of observations that we know is coming given that we're starting in a state right now? Given that my robot is right by the door right now, what is the probability that I'm going to see the sequence of floor camera shots that I know are coming? Well, if it's, you can imagine that if you can start in certain places in the apartment and there are some sequences of floor states that are much more likely than other ones, based on where those floor um, coverings are in different places of your apartment. So alpha said, what's the probability of being in a state given everything that's come before? Beta says, what's the probability of being in a state given everything that's coming ahead? We can calculate that the same way. It's done slightly differently in order to make it work for future calculations that we want to do. We're going to define bt sub i what is the probability that we are going to be in state i at time t as being, um, well, it's not a probability, it's just a, a, a value. Uh, it's going to be 1. And then inductively, we're going to work back and we're going to say the probability of beta t sub i is going to be the sum over all of the states that we might go to of the beta, the beta parameter t plus 1 sub j and we're going to move backwards and multiply at times the observation at t plus 1, given that we're in state bj. We're moving into state bj. And then we're going to move backwards times the probability that we're going to go from i to j. So this is just kind of the, the opposite way. Given the probability of where, we're going to, where we could possibly be, what's the probability of seeing the observation there? And what's the probability of moving there? And so we're going to have to calculate this inductively, starting at time t minus 1 and then t, t, time t minus 2, and then all the way back until time t1, so we move, we move the other direction for beta, 
And when we have that, we're going to have an analogous um, solution to alpha. Beta looks a little different. Instead of being many states going to one, it's one state going to many. Beta sub t, beta b, beta sub t sub i says, what's the probability at time t that I am in this state given the observations that I know are coming? In order to calculate that, I have to know what b t plus one is, and then I'm moving backwards step by step using what I know about the observation probabilities and knowing what I know about the A transition probabilities, not alpha, the A transition probabilities from I to a particular next state. Okay, so that is a very elegant solution called the forward-backward algorithm. That gives us the ability to answer our first of three questions for hidden Markov models. What is the probability of an observation sequence given a model? We'll tackle the next question in our next sequence of lectures. Thank you for your attention.